All right, welcome everyone tonight to tonight's program. Uh, Julian Assange, WikiLeaks, and the National Security State with Kevin Gostola. Um, we're joined tonight, as the name implies, with Kevin Gostola. Kevin is the uh, managing editor of shadowproof.com. Kevin also uh, curates uh, a newsletter called uh, The Dissenters, which is about whistleblowers. So Kevin has done a lot of work on whistleblowers, including Julian Assange and Chelsea Manning, uh, John Kiriakou and others. So uh, we really look forward to this discussion tonight. Uh, it's a very important topic as we all recognize the story about Julian Assange is at the intersection of US foreign policy, uh, media coverage, free speech, censorship, a lot of other important topics. So uh, it's, it's really important that we, that we talk about this. Um, Kevin, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Yes, thank you. I think it's really, it's really good to be able to speak with all of you. Great, so um, yeah, so we'll get right into it um, to get us started tonight. Okay, actually first, let me just say, uh, this event is sponsored by Massachusetts Peace Action. We are a grassroots peace organization focused on uh, building a more diplomatic US foreign policy, ending wars, abolishing nuclear weapons, uh, ending, ending sanctions on countries like Venezuela, Iran, and uh, um, Syria and other countries. So, so Mass Peace Action is sponsoring this event. And uh, yeah, with that, we'll, we'll, we'll hop right into it. Um, Kevin, to get us started, could you, could you tell us, uh, could you give us an update of where, where, Ju where, where the case is with Julian Assange? What is, what's going on with Julian Assange? And even before you do that, could, could you uh, back up a little bit? And uh, in case people aren't aware, briefly, could you just briefly tell us who is Julian Assange? What is WikiLeaks? And why does the U.S. government want to imprison Julian Assange? Yeah, and uh, thanks uh, again. Uh, it's great to talk to all of you. Uh, let me just start by sharing a quote that I, that I have here in front of me from Julian, who spoke at a Stop the War rally in 2011 in London. And I raised this because it was an example that Julian Assange's legal team included in their argument that Julian has been uh, pursued for prosecution by the US government due to his political opinions as a journalist. You know, it's not just that he's engaged in journalists, journalism that's exposed the workings of the US military and their involvement in war crimes. It's not only that he's exposed the way that US diplomacy is conducted often in ways that uh, pr promote the interests of the military industrial complex, but he also has these views himself. He believes in peace and he believes in the power of information to bring about this. And so he said at this rally, we must form our own networks of strength and mutual value which can challenge those strengths and self-interested values of warmongers in this country and in others that have formed hand in hand an alliance to take money from the United States. And he continued to say, we have revealed information showing the everyday squalor and barbarity of war, information such as the individual deaths of over 130,000 people in Iraq, individual deaths that were kept secret by the US military who denied that they have counted the deaths of civilians. And he, and, he, and he added, I want to tell you what I think is the way that wars come to be and that wars can come undone. It should lead us all, all to an understanding that if, if wars can be started by lies, peace can be started by truth. So you know, that's something that really resonates with me. If wars can be started by lies, Peace can be started by truth. Um, and so this is, a, this is a person who had a radical idea for journalism that instead of just keeping the source materials for ourselves, journalists could make them public. Journalists could share these materials. So it, before WikiLeaks, the way that journalism would be done would be to keep 
uh, evidence of, of war crimes private and, and to just say in a news article that we obtained these documents from the US government, it shows, and then they would tell you what it revealed and, but we wouldn't get to see what journalists were working with. So, so WikiLeaks said, let's make it all available. Then media can work on these documents, but the public can also look at these documents themselves and they can make their own decisions. And of course, now what's been going on with this case as a result of the Justice Department under Donald Trump bringing charges against him is a publisher for the first time in US history is being prosecuted under the United States Espionage Act, a law that was passed in 1917 and actually was always used to go after dissent and went after tens of thousands of people who were against involvement in World War I, uh, people who spoke out against war then. Uh, it was used as a tool against peace activists. So it's probably not that unusual that in this modern age, we see this as a, a, a weapon that the Justice Department relies upon to go after whistleblowers or people who leak information to the press. And, uh, and, and now they've escalated, they've gone a step further. The US government is now going after dissident media or people who are, are, are more um, open in their advocacy when they engage in journalism. So uh, people who have influence, who have the kind of platform and get the kind of attention and notoriety that Julian Assange had become targets of the US government. And the charges he faces are 17 charges under the Espionage Act. He also faces one uh, being accused of helping Chelsea Manning crack a password. And of course, as many of you likely know, all of the documents at issue in this case come from Chelsea Manning, the whistleblower, the US Army whistleblower who provided this material to WikiLeaks back in 2010. We're talking about a collateral murder video, uh, which was is very, very uh, well known uh, because it showed an Apache helicopter attack in Baghdad, killing Reuters journalists, as well as also a, an innocent person who was there to try and rescue those people who were fired upon, um, and he ended up being killed. Um, and then there's the Iraq war logs, the Afghanistan war logs, massive, massive number of, uh, of US diplomatic cables, as well as files on the Guantanamo Bay prisoners. And all of those are things that the government is going after Julian Assange for publishing with WikiLeaks. And as of now, the latest, latest development in Julian Assange's case is that Joe Biden's administration, the Justice Department, which is still in a bit of a transition, it does not have an attorney general yet. Merrick Garland, who is the attorney general pick, has not been formally, uh, well, has not gone through the confirmation yet. Uh, however, in, in this transition phase of Biden's Justice Department, they are pushing on with the appeal of extradition. Julian Assange did win in the district court in, in, in the UK against the United States. He, he won on January 4th, but I think it's fair to say it was somewhat of a technicality because uh, the district judge whose name was Vanessa Baretzer, she decided that almost all of the arguments brought against Julian Assange for being involved in journalism, uh, criminalizing his journalism, that those were legitimate. The only problem is she looked at the United States' prison system and she looked at his mental health and what has happened to him as a result of arbitrary detention that he's endured over the last decade, whether it be in the Ecuador embassy or uh, now inside uh, the Belmarsh prison. And she said, if he was extradited to the United States, he would likely try to commit suicide. And 
I'm not convinced that the U.S. facility would prevent him from, you know, being cruelly abused and succeeding in taking his own life. And therefore, I find it, I can't, I, I find that I cannot approve this extradition because it would be oppressive for mental health reasons. And so the extradition request was denied. This is what the U.S. Justice Department under Joe Biden will be appealing if it does in fact go forward with the case. But as of now, there are also dozens of groups that are human rights organizations, that are civil liberties organizations and press freedom organizations, very prominent, well-known outfits like ACLU, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, uh, and all of these groups have, have said, uh, as, as well as Reporters Without Borders who have done significantly uh, very, very good work on this case, um, more of an international organization, but one that made an attempt to be at every day of the extradition hearing, even though the judge blocked these kinds of observers from attending. Um, but all of these organizations have condemned this case and are, are demanding that Joe Biden drop the charges. Okay, uh, thanks. Thanks for that, Kevin. So uh, just a quick note about format. Um, we have some questions that we are we will be asking Kevin tonight and we'll also be taking audience Q&A uh, in, in the latter half of the program. So if you all have any questions, uh, make, make a note of them and you will get your chance. Uh, okay, so uh, Kevin, let me get this straight. So you said, I think the date you mentioned was January 4th when his uh, ex extradition case was in the UK. Um, at that time, Donald Trump was president and his Justice Department was trying to extradite him. And if I understand you correctly, are you saying that Joe Biden's uh, Justice Department will also be trying to extradite Julian Assange? Uh, is that correct? And uh, so the question is, uh, what is what is Joe Biden's position towards Julian Assange and WikiLeaks? Is it any different from Trump? Yeah, so we had a, what I'd call an extradition trial in September. And for anyone who missed that uh, trial and, 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 and wants uh, a, a kind of summary, um, I invite you to go to uh, the newsletter that I, I posted at, at the center, D I S S E N T E R dot substack dot com, because I did daily reports for each of the days of this trial. And uh, you can get a good summary of what happened and, and, and see how the arguments were laid out by the defense. They called witnesses. There were some very important people who provided testimony like Noam Chomsky and Daniel Ellsberg, both contributed testimony in support of Julian Assange, as well as someone who was a victim of CIA torture and rendition. His name, Khaled El Masri, who told about the way WikiLeaks cables had been a benefit in his ability to win some damages, some compensation for the abuse he endured from the European Court of Human Rights. And, and so he shared his story with the court and he spoke up in, 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 in defense of Julian Assange and against the United States who could, who, who is still, you know, feasibly persecuting him in his own country. He's, he lives in Germany. Um, and so this unfolded in September. And then on January 4th, we got the decision in the case. And so now, as you're asking with Joe Biden, we know that Joe Biden, historically, he called Julian Assange a high-tech terrorist back in 2010 when these disclosures were made. I believe that was on Meet the Press that he described Julian Assange in this manner. We know that the Obama administration was rather hostile toward these disclosures. Uh, and yet, uh, I, I share this because jo uh, Joe Biden is constantly attaching himself to what the Obama administration did to make him seem like an alternative to Trump, um, to make people see see that you know 
he is uh, worthwhile as uh, uh, this is how he was elected president. He was really running on the reputation of President Barack Obama. And so in that case, we should note and we should promote this aggressively, the fact that Attorney General Eric Holder had an opportunity to prosecute Julian Assange through a grand jury investigation that was impaneled in Alexandria, Virginia, and they decided not to indict Julian Assange because they were afraid that they would open up a Pandora's box that would mean that they were now obligated to indict journalists at places like the New York Times or Washington Post for what Julian Assange was accused of doing. In other words, there was no meaningful difference between what Julian Assange did and what any other journalist did with those materials. So they didn't really have a good case unless they wanted to completely undermine and jeopardize freedom of press under the First Amendment and our Constitution. So they did not indict Julian Assange. Now, Mike Pompeo as CIA director and Jeff Beauregard Sessions as attorney general, they did not have this squeamishness. That's how Mike Pompeo referred to it, this squeamishness. I don't think that's the word I would use, but uh, they were not against going after the right to publish. And they made certain that there were charges brought against Julian Assange, and they specifically went after these materials in 2010, rather than any other disclosures. I mean, I'll just point out that they didn't go after the Clinton campaign emails that swept up WikiLeaks and Assange in a lot of, um, of, of, of controversy, if not propaganda, about what Assange and WikiLeaks may or may not have been doing with Russians who could possibly have been connected to WikiLeaks. Uh, they did not go after highly, highly classified sensitive materials that a lot of people don't know about, but involved cyber warfare tools of the CIA. This is called Vault 7. They did not prosecute Assange for that. They decided to go after the most respected, laudable actions of WikiLeaks in 2010. This is, this is, this is work that was award-winning back in 2010. If people like WikiLeaks, if people support WikiLeaks, this is what they support them for, for the work they did back in 2010. First and foremost, this is what they celebrate. And so Joe Biden, um, he... Um, I, I don't I don't know what his own personal view is, but I will say that the New York Times did a questionnaire where they asked all of the primary candidates, the Democratic primary candidates, what their view was of this case. He gave a very um, uh, boilerplate answer. It, it didn't inspire a lot of confidence in me because he didn't speak to the specifics. So so where you know, for example. Senator Bernie Sanders as a candidate said he didn't think the US government should be in the business of picking and choosing who is and is not a journalist and, and engage in these kinds of prosecutions under the Espionage Act. Joe Biden said something paying lip service to um, the national security concerns of, of leaking classified information and um, you know, said that uh, you know, he would have to take a closer look at the case if he was president yada, yada, yada. So it didn't really make me feel that good about a future when Joe Biden might be elected president. And now we're here. And, you know, the other thing people should know is that Joe Biden was personally involved in trying to make certain that NSA whistleblower Edward Snowden did not find uh, an asylum in Ecuador or any other country for that matter. And eventually that is what led to him being stuck in the Moscow airport. And that's why he's in exile in Russia. And you know, he's still unable to return home because he could not go to trial and make a public interest defense. And, and, and you may think that has nothing to do with Julian Assange's case, but in fact it does because allegations were added to the indictment months, just a couple months before the extradition trial 
that's that set, singled out Julian Assange and WikiLeaks for assisting Edward Snowden in getting on a plane to leave Hong Kong and go to this country, which he never ended up making it to. He never made it to Ecuador, but he was on his way to Ecuador and was able to get on a plane with assistance from WikiLeaks. So, you know, I believe that Joe Biden is like a lot of liberal Democrats who is unwilling to support Julian Assange. But what I don't know is where Merrick Garland as attorney general is going to stand and how he's going to defend this prosecution. Because eventually, once we have a formal leadership of the Justice Department, they are going to have to defend going forward with this case because it is too popular. It is, uh, well, it's not popular and like people don't support it, but it is too well known. It's It has so much notoriety that any figure who runs the Justice Department has to give some kind of justification. And I don't know how they're going to justify it, given the fact that the Obama administration did not want to prosecute um, or did not feel that they could defend prosecuting Julian Assange about eight years ago, nearly eight years ago. Right. That's so interesting that uh, uh, Eric Holder didn't want to prosecute uh, Julian Assange essentially because it would open the floodgates for all these other media to prosecutions to do against other media reporters. Um, speaking of the media, and actually before I get to the next question, let me point everyone to the chat. Uh, Kevin mentioned his uh, newsletter, dissenter.substack.com. I shared a link in the chat so people can check that out if they're interested. All right, um, you mentioned uh, the New York Times and uh, speaking of the New York Times and uh, this, this uh, legacy media, Washington Post and uh, whatever you wanna call it, establishment media or corporate media, uh, MSNBC, how has their coverage been of the whole uh, Julian Assange saga and WikiLeaks? So I confess that I haven't been much of a media watchdog because I've been producing my own coverage of the Assange trial, which it's not going to be a surprise that I would feel it's much better than their coverage. That's just probably what you'd expect me to say out of respect for the work that I've been doing. But uh, it, but if I had to gauge the kinds of coverage, I would say that people who followed mainstream coverage in general, this legacy media in general, if you followed their coverage of the extradition trial, what you took away, uh, if, if I had to guess, I don't know, is you, you all can confirm to me uh, because uh, you, you're not, you know, you're not journalists, you're activists trying to get this information and, 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 and make your own conclusions about what's unfolding. But if I had to guess what you were reading, you probably saw that uh, Julian Assange had some kind of secret family and uh, his, his fiance, um, who is Stella Morris, who is, is uh, a, a really good advocate of, of Julian's, uh, they, that, that he fathered two children in the Ecuador embassy. Uh, so there was all this salacious coverage of a secret family and then also uh, you probably saw headlines early in the extradition trial about Julian Assange disrupting proceedings. So it made him seem like he was kind of an unstable man who perhaps was suffering from psychosis and, uh, and was, was highly erratic during the proceedings and the judge had to tell him to be quiet. And uh, if he had any Thing to say he should talk to his lawyers and the lawyers would present his concerns to the judge um, you know going onward maybe towards the end you did get some reasonable headlines that spoke to the press freedom issues that in this case there were a few days when something really astounding was a focus for 24, 48 hours. And that's the fact that there was a spying operation on Julian Assange while he was in the Ecuador embassy that his legal team believes was backed by the CIA or, or, or more widely US intelligence. 
It was part of this pressure campaign that Ecuador was involved in in order to push him out of the embassy, uh, help them revoke the asylum that they granted. Uh, eventually, he did have his citizenship to Ecuador revoked, and then he was uh, arrested in April of 2019. So you might have seen that there was conversation by this private security company that try, uh, where they tried to, uh, they, they talked about potentially uh, poisoning Julian Assange in the embassy if they could get to him. They talked about leaving the door of the embassy open so that the, and this was a security company, they talked about leaving the door open so that people could come in and kidnap Julian Assange and take him from the embassy. Um, and so maybe that made its way out. But by and large, I'm uh, sorry, Kevin. Uh, real quick, um, who who was talking about all this, the uh, poisoning, Julian Assange, and all that stuff you just mentioned? Yeah. So let me be clear here. Thank you. Uh, the there is a director of this company called Undercover Global. It's in Spain, and it was contracted to do security for the Ecuador embassy in the United Kingdom. And David Morales is the director who, according to two whistleblowers who provided testimony for the extradition trial, but there are also witnesses in a case that the Spanish court has taken up based on the, uh, the, the concerns of Julian Assange himself. So he has his own, so, what, it, so there's a lot to keep track of, but while he is facing an extradition case, he also is bringing a case alleging his privacy was violated by this private security company, and he's bringing it through the Spanish court system. Of course, you don't have any coverage of this case at all. No regular coverage here in the United States that this is happening. Um, El País, a Spanish newspaper, does have an English edition that posts online, and it's a good resource if you want to keep up to date on developments with the case. But David Morales apparently talked to two um, two, two employees talked to two to these employees, and one of them, a whistleblower, shared that it, that um, on on one occasion, David Morales was talking about what they could do to escalate things to to finally get Assange out of the embassy, and it was considered that they could poison him, or that they might be able to leave the door open, and then people would be able to just enter and kidnap Julian Assange. So, you know, uh, there was a there was a very real pressure campaign, and that was uh, that received some coverage towards the end of the extradition trial. But there, there honestly wasn't a whole lot of um, regular mainstream coverage of this trial. We we even had uh, a, a a BBC reporter express the fact that. Uh, he had become bored with the proceedings, and so for a few days, um, there you know there wasn't any coverage, and and he he told us all to just be patient. You know, it, it would make its way back into the headlines eventually, but there really wasn't anything interesting to post. And in you know, in contrast to that opinion from someone within the British news media who, who's in the establishment media there, oh, I was publishing these regular reports daily that I think showed that every day there was something significant happening with the extradition trial, whether it involved putting US torture and US war crimes on trial, um, using the extradition trial to expose that conduct, to give that further attention, or, um, looking at US prisons and, and what would happen to Julian Assange if he's incarcerated or detained in a US jail or prison, um, going through and examining uh, press freedom issues in this case and how uh, the, and the history of the Espionage Act and uh, the way media actually functions. Because one of our key goals as people who believe the, the, the charges should be dropped. Um, and, and I think, uh, you know, for, for anyone who's an activist, the key thing to do in communities 
is to really destigmatize this conduct. Like we need to educate people on how so many have been programmed to think that what WikiLeaks did was anything different from journalism, because I think that's why the government has been able to get away with bringing this case against Julian Assange. If we can convince the population that WikiLeaks engages in journalism, then it's going to be almost impossible to defend going forward with this under a Biden administration, especially given the fact that almost daily, the Biden administration is now making pronouncements about how they are for freedom of media in the world. Um, they're doing this because they need to show or, 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 or project this image of the US being different from China or Russia. And in challenging those powers, they are constantly talking about freedom of media. Um, but if they believe in freedom of media, they should I think there's a couple things we could demand of this Biden administration. But first and foremost, drop the charges against Julian Assange. Um, and then if I have, and then the other two requests I would make first and foremost would be stop using the Espionage Act to bring prosecutions against people who are former government employees or current government employees or contractors who blew the whistle or leaked information to journalists because they are not spies. They are not committing treason by sharing this information, the public with, with, with the media. And finally, stop, stop taking journalists' electronic devices at the US border and searching those devices without warrant. This goes on on a regular basis and it undermines freedom of the press greatly. Yeah, sure. Um, I, 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 I do understand WikiLeaks and to be a form of journalism and Julian Assange to be a journalist. Um, so uh, is the US government trying to make some sort of different case that he's hurt national security? Is that what their case is? Is Julian Assange, is he not an Australian citizen? Can you, uh, how can they extradite someone to the US who's a foreign citizen? Have they done that before? Um, I guess I'll leave it at that for now. You're putting your finger on the critical issue. The critical issue is why does the United States have a right to enforce its secrecy regulations against anybody who isn't a US citizen? And more importantly, anybody who hasn't signed a contract with the United States government agreeing to not disclose classified information. I'm well aware of the fact that these people who have been prosecuted have signed non-disclosure agreements and they, they, they said they would, in order to hold their security clearance, they said, I will not share this information with anybody else who you know, doesn't have a, a need to know or a security clearance. You know, so this is a separate thing and um, you know, we can get into that uh, during a, a separate webinar. But Julian Assange never signed a non-disclosure agreement. He's never worked for a US government agency. He's never lived in the United States. He has no US citizenship. As you say, he's an Australian citizen who by the way, his government has failed tremendously by not protecting him from what the US is doing. Um, they seem to really not care about what this means for freedom of the press. Um, and, and they're just letting this unfold. Um, and uh, they, 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 barely can, they barely can express their concerns about the health that, it, that, that his health is deteriorating in, uh, a de in the jail, in Belmarsh High Security Prison. He, they'll barely say anything about what he's enduring in that facility. So, so 
if this goes forward and is successful, I mean, to some extent, it's already set a precedent that is negative because the judge in the extradition decision, while she rejected the request, at the same time, she embraced 90% of the arguments, if not more, that the U.S. government put forward, saying that there was a legitimate reason for the U.S. government to pursue. So she believes that the conduct of Julian Assange wasn't journalism, that it veered into criminal behavior, that he was soliciting these leaks, that he was encouraging Chelsea Manning to hack uh, military computers in order to obtain information, that he was helping her navigate these computers anonymously so that the US government could not detect her, which would allow her to leak additional information. Um, and so if this is successful, what it means is that the US has been able to enforce its own secrecy laws against other people around the world. Like they, now they can go after foreigners and target foreign journalists who obtain US government documents. They can, we, the US government would be able to use its power to, to go after someone who was from a Latin American country who obtained these documents about, let's say, CIA um, actions in Venezuela. Um, we could see, uh, we could also see a kind of, um, you know, might bring back memories of the Cold War as you see, you know, perhaps China take this as permission to pursue other journalists, other foreign journalists, in order to have them brought to their country and put on trial for publishing their own state secrets. Or in, in my view, I feel like we could see Israel or, or Turkey, or we could see potentially Brazil decide that they want to assert their authority over their secrets and extradite journalists who are not citizens of their countries, but you know they could be Americans, they could be um, they could be Europeans, they might be Asians, or maybe they'd be in maybe they'd be Australians too. But they would be able to go after these journalists because they felt like the United States did it, and you know they support press freedom, and so they believe that. They, they would argue and justify it by saying, we're just going after people who are engaged in crimes. Um, there's a difference. Uh, you know, uh, one thing that these prosecutors will say is that journalism, engaging in journalism, doesn't mean that you are above the law. Um, it's, a, it's a kind of an obnoxious refrain that they, they state um, because um, you know, it's, 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 it's their way of justifying targeting media, but, but what they say, but what they're saying is that like being journalists who help whistleblowers, being journalists who allow for leakers to be your sources, that, you know, if, if you are too helpful, then you might be implicated yourself and they might prosecute you. And so this is really troubling where we are headed if we are not able to stop this case against Julian Assange. Um, okay, so uh, is it fair to say that the, uh, the, some of these uh, national security agencies such as the CIA or the NSA or the FBI that they, they want to imprison Assange. Uh, to what extent are they involved in this? And if so, why? Do they want to make an example out of him? So what's the connection with the security agencies here? Yeah, so um, as I mentioned, uh, there's, uh, there's the Vault 7 materials that a lot of people don't know anything about, but it revealed these tools that the CIA was, were using in order to plant uh, mal malware in, and, and target um, televisions, um, computers, 
also to disrupt apps, um, uh, messaging apps. Pe people may be familiar with WhatsApp. People might know about Signal um, and uh, to, to target those. Um, it went after Apple's operating system on, on the phone, on, on iPhones, et cetera. And so um, this was something that was revealed in February of 2017. And then following that, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, well, he wasn't Secretary of State yet. Uh, he was CIA director. As CIA director, he decided to make as a focus of his first speech going after WikiLeaks. He made that a central part of um, his time at the CIA, that he was going to go after Julian Assange. Um, and, and, and he said things like, we can't allow Juli people like Julian Assange and WikiLeaks to promote false narratives um, about the United States. And uh, you know, he, he also was very clear that he did not think Julian Assange deserved or, or, or should be granted First Amendment rights. He did not think Julian Assange um, was covered. And uh, as I said previously, he said something about uh, not being squeamish, uh, about going after uh, people, or about going after the right to publish. Um, uh, so he was willing to make this a focus of the CIA. And so I do think that a lot of what we saw happen in this case so far was fueled by uh, the CIA's interest in prosecuting Julian Assange. So that's, to me, clear national security involvement. Uh, something else that I can share quickly is that there's a strategy document that was signed by President Donald Trump that outlined what were some of the threats I put threats in quotes because they're always exaggerated to some extent. And one of the things that this document, which Donald Trump signed, listed out was that uh, along with uh, the usual list of so-called enemy countries that we are trying to challenge, like China, Russia, Iran, Cuba, uh, and terrorist groups, which you know, obviously, um, the U.S. is always uh, justifying military operations and, and targeting them in different theaters around the world. And along with these, our government believes that leak to vist that is, that activists that are leakers too, and public disclosure organizations. So that would be like any organization inspired by WikiLeaks or WikiLeaks itself, that they are threats to the United States. Single them out as national security threats in this document that covers 2020 through 2022. Um, and so I think as far as it goes, we should look at the espionage and lawfare in this case against Julian Assange as a part of the national security state trying to neutralize what they believe is a threat. And, uh, you know, on one hand, I think it's probably right that it's a kind of a threat because WikiLeaks has been highly successful in exposing the inner workings of the US national security apparatus and, and the wider conduct of American empire. Um, in fact, there's a whole book um, out from v Verso just going through all the diplomatic cables and, and outlining what we all learned about the world um, according to these cables. And, and, and the, this, this isn't conduct that makes the United States look good. It doesn't make them look like a beacon of democracy and freedom for the world. Um, but then that being said, obviously, um, we do not need national security institutions being involved in uh, disrupting uh, the ability of media organizations to operate. That 
that represents an attack on freedom of the press. And that's why so many view this case as a part of a wider war on journalism. Right. Okay. Uh, just for just for uh, logistics here, it looks like we will be going uh, past eight, just so we can, uh, you know, ask questions and get a full hearing to this topic. I understand some people may have to leave at eight, and that's fine. Uh, this event is being recorded, and we'll be sharing the video out. So, uh, so no worries there. Um, there's a couple questions in the chat here. And, and okay, let's start taking questions from the audience too. So if people have questions, they can use their raise hand feature in Zoom and I can call on them to ask their question or they can put their questions in the chat. Okay, there's a couple questions in the chat here. People are asking basically, what are, what are some of the biggest stories uh, WikiLeaks has reported on? What, 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 are, what are some of the stories they've reported on that have had the most impact on our societal discourse? Yeah, so to me, I'll, I'll focus first, firstly on what shows Julian Assange is likely being retaliated against by the United States. The legal team for Assange put a lot of focus on revelations related to how the U.S. government interfered with European countries like Germany and Spain, which were intent to prosecute CIA officers or agents who were involved in renditions and torture of individuals. And there, the cables contained evidence of, uh, in, in Germany of, um, of prosecutors, being coerced into not bringing indictments against uh, the, 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 the agents who were implicated in that rendition against Khaled al-Masri. Uh, so, so that was very um, Im important. Um, it helped Khaled al-Masri win damages, as I mentioned before, before the European Court of Human Rights. Um, we have in Spain also the fact that then they were looking into investigating Bush administration officials and the Obama administration stepped in to dis discourage them from seriously pursuing any, any kind of, a, a, of an investigation into the conduct of let's say Donald Rumsfeld or Dick Cheney or anybody else who would have been seriously implicated. Um, you know, more broadly, um, I, I look at the, the sets of documents and, 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 and this is what I would list, that with the Iraq war logs, we uncovered an astounding 15,000 civilian deaths in the Iraq war that had not been previously known. That is, even with the reporting that was available, and even with the work that some nonprofit organizations did to track the deaths of civilians in a war zone, uh, they did not have um, any evidence or confirmation of these deaths until they obtained these military incident reports and were able to add them to their official tally. So that is a big deal. And you know, in, uh, on top of that, uh, the Iraq war logs revealed that the United States or, or provided further confirmation that the United States was handing over or, or allowing Iraqi security forces and Iraqi military to take detainees and engage in torture. And we were looking the other way. In fact, we had a military order that said that US military were not to get involved in investigating the conduct of Iraqi security forces that were involved in torture. Uh, that the cables contain some of the first evidence and details about our use of drones in Pakistan um, and as well as their use in Yemen. Um, they also in, uh, contained evidence um, showing that uh, Yemen was going to give the U.S. cover 
for our use of drones. Um, they could they contained evidence though that ended up being hu uh, hugely instrumental in Pakistan's um, in, in uh, one of their uh, higher courts. They were able to use the evidence in the cables in order to get the court to rule that what the CIA was doing through its program in Pakistan was um, criminal activity. It constituted war crimes. And by winning that, it, it drove down the rate of drone attacks so that they were you know, you know, barely happening on a regular basis in Pakistan because the, the government had concluded that that was that they, they were war crimes. So, um, you know, these are some of the things that stand out in my mind. Uh, we uh, ha had with the Guantanamo files th that we were able to get a clear picture of the lies and propaganda for nearly 800 of these people who had been brought there, you know, further showing that they were not the worst of the worst as Donald Rumsfeld had claimed. And that uh, there are like six, seven, six to eight detainees there who were helping the United States manufacture evidence against Guantanamo Bay prisoners in order to help the US military justify keeping them in indefinite detention uh, to be held there indefinitely without charge or trial. So, uh, this th this was a big deal. Um, I, I think you know it it really provided um, crucial information about the way that the United States wages war. And uh, even if it hasn't altered the way that our military uh, industrial complex operates, even though you know it, it's as healthy as ever, I wouldn't be as cynical to say that it didn't have an impact because all of this is is was exceptional material that we all needed to know yeah definitely all right so we'll take uh some audience questions now uh we'll take a question from andrew then michael then uh siddhartha uh, so uh, I'll call on Andrew next. Uh, please unmute yourself and uh, introduce yourself if you like and ask your question. Andrew. Yeah. Can you hear me? Uh, I can. Uh, perfect. Uh, so yeah, I'm Andrew. I'm 23 and I'm from uh, central Massachusetts. Um, so I grew up largely in the post 9-11 era. And so uh, unfortunately, some of the people of my generation see only the propagandized version of intelligence agencies. Um, but yeah, so my, my question, though, is, uh, do you see any connection between all of what you just described and the events that happened in January at the Capitol? Yeah, I'm not, I, I'm not sure. Um, other than to say that, uh, to, to some degree, the there there is this discontent in our country, and there are a lot of people who are not necessarily sure how to express their rage towards this U.S. government, and that's where I think the work of activists uh, as well as journalists and to some degree, cultural figures, that's where they are important because we have to find some way to direct that rage because it is, it is righteous and people are looking for answers. They're looking for explanations for why they feel the way they do. And some people end up lost. They, they want to turn towards racism and xenophobia um, and they, they, they turn to explanations for, for why the people they support have lost that are not based in truth or reality. But um, it, it, it's up to us to try and, and, and help people find something more constructive and less destructive in the way that they 
express this discontent and the way that they direct that energy into something. And so to me, you know, if it connects at all to Julian Assange and WikiLeaks, if it connects at all to this prosecution against Assange, the very real fact is that, you know, Assange is a figure who was very cynical towards the entire U.S. empire. Um, and in fact, uh, there, is a, there is a film about him called Underground. There's a book about the earlier stage of his life. He was a notorious hacker who was involved in compromising Pentagon's uh, systems. Um, and he engaged in criminal activity and he, and he was put on trial for that in Australia. And so then come 2006, when WikiLeaks was founded, this represents a much more constructive way of channeling that rage and that discontent towards the United States, of trying to help people. And in fact, one of the first disclosures, one of the first publications related to information in Kenya. You know, WikiLeaks just was fortunate that there was a courageous figure like Chelsea Manning, who was willing to provide so much information and uh, that's that's not something that happens all the time. Um, it was so credible. Um, a lot of times you get information that you can't verify that doesn't amount to what uh, you know what that person is claiming to expose. But but this was very rich and has been a resource for many many scholars. And I know that somebody was asking. Um, so if I can fold into my answer. The name of that book from Verso is called The WikiLeaks Files, The World According to U.S. Empire. Um, and it came out in 2016. So you can look for that book if you want to dig into WikiLeaks revelations further. But if I was to connect the two events, I would just say that, um, you know, the, the discontent that Julian Assange was feeling, you know, is not different, not all that different from what I think a lot of people feel at that capital, even if they're showing it in a way that is um, obviously destructive. Okay, uh, thanks Andrew for that question and thanks Kevin. So what we'll do is uh, we'll take questions from Michael, Siddhartha and Paul and then we'll begin to start wrapping up this program. Uh, Michael, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. I wanted to get more of a historical perspective perspective on the issue. I, I recently read the Jakarta Method by Vincent Bevins that talks about the mass murder program that the CIA was helping to to coordinate in Indonesia. But then we had the, the Church Commission in the mid-70s that said, no, the way the CIA goes around the world and beats people up and kills people and tortures is just not the proper way to do it. And then it seemed we got the National Endowment for Democracy, which under Reagan was created to, I guess, do things a bit differently. I mean, a kinder, gentler way to kill people. And so it seems that no matter what's done, you know, it's kind of like a roller coaster. They, they, the, the industrial, what do you call it? The intelligence industrial part of the military industrial they, there's rules in place that they're not allowed to do things, but then they always find a way to contract that out. And so I'm trying to understand, you know, this is, I guess, who we are, and it's who uh, the rest of the world looks up to in some way, and all based on certain personality types that tend to lead these kind of organizations. So I, I'm kind of wondering what I understand it would be good if everyone understood this, but then what could be done after, you know, we get all this information, you can only take in so much of this information about how horrible the US has acted on the planet for the past 200 years. And then you start to wonder, okay, now what? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, oh, I think you're describing uh, the way in which anyone who's in tuned with these issues and does this work covering 
matters of peace and justice or advocating for peace and justice, how easy it is to become jaded and how easy it is to turn cynical, cynical and believe that struggling for the, the, the change that is ne not only, you know, necessary, but, but which people should righteously demand, how easy it is to become tired and, and feel like it doesn't matter. And I've noticed in my work lately that m almost all of the reporting that I do, there's at least a handful of individuals who will reply, are you surprised or what did you expect? Um, and to me, that it doesn't mean that people believe that this is the right thing for the government to be doing. It's just that they don't believe that there is anything anybody in this country can do to alter what the military industrial complex does on a daily basis or to change the way that political elites handle these issues. And I think, you know, if, if, if I had to say one thing that is toxic to any future, it is this, this idea that, you know, the further reporting that might be put out there or, um, you know, people making demands of their own government that, that we're going to fall into this trap of believing that it's just useless to keep expecting because, you know, I think, um, I, I know that that's not what you were, you, you were trying to say exactly Michael, but uh, I, I just think as, as, as maybe a, a sort of sidebar to what you were raising, one thing we have to be concerned about is allowing this to continue to be normal. All of this being normal, I mean, you know, the whole thing of Biden's election was that we were gonna go back to normal. And so over the next three to four months, we are going to see not what was okay under President Donald Trump, but we're gonna see what is acceptable under Joe Biden or under any president of the United States. And that to me is some of the more alarming aspects of our present day. And, and that's what we have to deal with. Um, and so I, I thank Michael for that kind of thumbnail history of how the elites who are involved in these national security institutions have been able to engage in brutality for the last half century and reinvent themselves so that they continue. And now what they're doing is they're hiding behind identity. They're saying that, oh, we've appointed an African-American person to be the Pentagon secretary, or, oh, we've appointed a woman to make these decisions about the Pentagon, or, oh, we're going to have a, a woman in charge of the, 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 the national intelligence agency. Uh, and so she'll control all of the mass surveillance programs. And, and so um, this is a victory for diversity. And, we sh and, and instead, what it is, is it's just reinforcing everything about um, white patriarchy in the United States. Honestly, like if it's the most cynical use of identity in the history of this country and, and, and weaponizing it against people who are demanding changes um, as, uh, along the lines of peace and justice. And also, you know, I think in this time of great economic despair, demanding that there be something done in order to help people who are struggling to survive, who have been through um, this pandemic and, and, and felt its impacts uh, in, in such a devastating way. And so, you know, I, I, I would just say to people that I think that, you know, the last thing we can do is, is allow ourselves to look at the last 50 years of history and say, uh, it's never going to get better um, because I think obviously if that's our attitude, um, it, it, it's definitely going to be the case. And, and so that's why, you know, we should look for these things that can give us hope, you know, these things that, that, and that's why I think they, they move so fiercely to neutralize Julian Assange and WikiLeaks because they rep, they represent a re, they actually do represent a threat to what the U S was doing in that it 
can have an impact to the image and reputation of what the U.S. projects. It, it, get, it, it shows that the mythology around the United States truly is built around a bunch of lies. And, and that's why um, Julian Assange is in a high security prison. Great. Thanks, Michael, for that. And thank you, Kevin. Um, okay, so related to this topic of, uh, and a few people have brought this up, like, what can we do? Uh, what, you know, what should we do? Uh, okay, perfect answer here. There's a rally going on February 22nd uh, in Boston uh, at Park Street at 11 a.m. Uh, they'll be marching from uh, the Park Street location uh, to the Boston Globe to uh, protest in uh a favor of freeing Julian Assange. So if people are interested in that, they could email uh, Susan McLucas. Uh, she shared some information about this in the chat. Her email is susanbmcl at gmail.com. And I'll share information about this uh, rally in the follow-up email uh, that I'm gonna send to everyone here tomorrow. Okay, uh, next up, uh, we'll take a question from Siddhartha. It seems to me that uh, what happens to Assange will not only affect journalists, but all people who use thought, thinking, intellect as a way of life, as their vocation. I'm talking about researchers, I'm talking about scientists, faculty members, independent scholars, and so forth. We've already seen several instances of this happening over the last year or two. I'd point to the um, arrests of Chinese faculty, American faculty, uh, the suspicions, uh, indeed, maybe the institution of the, um, the Confucius Institutes on various American campuses that have been uh, closed down or are being threatened with closure, not to speak of uh, years, uh, six or seven years of being followed, uh, being driven off the road, uh, one's library accounts hacked, uh, that sort of thing, which I'm speaking from about uh, my own experience now. So I, I think th what's happening right now is uh, clamping down not only on Assange, but also on the production of knowledge. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I, I myself feel uh, that there is a crackdown on freedom of expression that is unfolding. Um, and, I, and I can say that uh, I am terribly concerned about where we are going in our response. So, you know, in, in this sense, I can actually connect this back to the events of what happened at the Capitol on January 6th uh, to say that I think that the response to far-right extremism in, is, is going to be um, in, an, in and of itself an extreme reaction to dealing with uh, that problem, how, however much it exists in our country, uh, because we are seeing a push by media, so, social media companies, these tech companies in Silicon Valley to um, designate a, a, a wide swath of reporting and journalism, as well as um, political thinking. And it's not just far right, but anything that they could describe as controversial or anything that they believe might alienate their advertisers. We are seeing that these, which are of course highly corporate institutions are deciding that they are going to remove the ability of people who are on their platforms to make money in order to derive income from producing those th that content. Um, and so that is happening on YouTube. It has affected people who are part of the progressive or wider left. It is a. Uh, it has affected, um, you know, me. Um, I, I posted a video talking to um, uh, former National Lawyers Guild President Marjorie Cohn um, about international law and other issues related to the Iraq war logs. 
Um, and because those war logs contain evidence of war crimes, that was deemed to be too controversial. And so um, my video is not allowed to bring in money on the YouTube website. So it's, you know, the work that I'm doing, I'm not able to derive any gain from it, but YouTube can. Um, anybody who's going to that video on YouTube is able to make money off of it, um, you know, by, by me bringing viewers to YouTube's website. So I think that this is a, this is a problem that we are, are seeing. Um, it's affecting people in academia. Um, it's affecting people who um, are, are finding that, um, that, you know, even if they felt that they were protected on their campuses, they could still be targeted. And I think it's very much connected because as, as I said, when I started uh, tonight, Julian Assange has been a, a, a target here because of his political opinions. And so if you understand that this isn't just uh, a, a question of the, the government refusing to recognize that certain actions are journalism and not criminal misconduct, then you, re then you realize that it's also an issue of them going after journalism because Julian Assange opposes certain conduct by the United States. And I think, you know, that's, that's where we can see that a lot of what is going on in the crackdown on people um, in all parts of the United States, that it, it has to do with the way that they express themselves. Right, I think this is a really important topic. So thank you, Cesartha, for bringing it up. Uh, uh, this this uh, big tech uh, censorship, essentially, of uh, dissenting voices. Uh, you mentioned, Kevin, how you were impacted by this. Uh, just recently, Mass Peace Action was impacted by this. Our own executive director was, uh, his Facebook account was locked for reasons which are unclear to us. And, uh, you know, when, when, when something like that happens, we, we have no recourse. What are we going to do? Uh, we've also recently signed up with this campaign where uh, various activist groups are pressuring Facebook to uh, stop banning Palestinians off of Facebook. Um, they're like, uh, they're, they're often like, they're, they're like the canaries in the coal mine for this stuff. Um, okay, so we'll take uh, two more questions here from uh, Paul and then Jay. Okay, uh, Paul. Okay, well, thanks, Kevin. Those are important uh, issues that uh, need a lot of discussion. I wanted to bring it back to the Assange case itself. I believe that a, um, a UN official was uh, in charge of investigating whether um, Assange has been subject to torture and did quite an extensive investigation of the case. Uh, there's not much time here, but could you just briefly summarize what that uh, UN official found? Yeah, so there was a UN Special Rapporteur on torture um, who either in his official capacity or somewhat outside of his official job used his position to conduct an investigation of the way in which Julian Assange was treated by uh, Sweden, um, Ecuador, as well as the United Kingdom and the United States. And uh, he, uh, did this analysis or, or he conducted this, well, first off, he, he sent people to go and do evaluations of Julian Assange to visit him in the Belmarsh prison and to see that, um, you know, the, the evidence of what he ended up describing as uh, symptoms of psychological torture, that's showing that this is someone who has endured psychological torture. Oh, and uh, and at the time that those people went and saw him in in, in May of 2019, I believe uh, we need to remember that that's um, close to seven years after he entered the Ecuador embassy. And so for all that time that he's in the embassy, um, he has very 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 limited exposure to sunlight. Um, uh, he, he's not able to go outdoors. Um, you know, it's not like he's typically sticking his head outside of a window. Uh, he doesn't have access to um, all of the medical care that he needs. He couldn't go see a dentist. 
Um, in fact, there was one doctor who noted his um, some of his medical issues as well as his problems with his teeth and were encouraging him to leave the embassy just so he could get health care. Of course, he wasn't about to leave the embassy because he knew he would be snatched and arrested. So he was willing to, to allow um, all of these uh, physical ailments to worsen in order to protect himself from going through what he is going through now um, and, and, and being detained in Belmarsh prison and facing this extradition to the United States. Um, so then within this report, uh, you know, there's all these other things. There's, there's so much to the Assange story because we've had so much time that has elapsed. And as you say, you just, I just can't get to it all right now, but to briefly pay it some attention, uh, there were the Swedish allegations, you know, related to uh, conduct uh, that uh, alleged that he had um, in engaged in some kind of sexual abuse against um, women in Sweden. And, uh, and there were so many due process issues and irregularities with that case, which Niels Meltzer documented that fueled the ability of um, the US government to keep this cloud of investigation hanging over Julian Assange's head so that um, you know, he was seen as a fugitive, so that they were able to label him as a fugitive from justice and to effectively make it seem like by seeking asylum, he was dodging accountability for his actions, even though the Swedish government um, basically started and stopped this case three times, and it never even reached the phase where actual charges were brought against Julian Assange. So it's, it's an abuse of the prosecutorial authority within Sweden. And um, the United Kingdom wouldn't let Swedish prosecutors come to the Ecuador embassy to question him for, for the longest time they were obstructing their access. Um, and so, or, or they were um, pressuring them not to come speak with Julian Assange. And importantly, I think the biggest thing about what Niels Meltzer did was that he outlined in great detail the extensive character assassination or public mobbing that has gone on against Julian Assange, where you almost have to admit to yourself that a large portion of the negative views that you have for this personality are entirely the creation of the US government or pundits uh, or, or elite figures within media at places like CNN or the New York Times who have demonized Assange greatly and, and, and aided in this prosecution by creating a climate in which it would be acceptable for this case to take place. You know, it's, um, you know, we can think back to the 1960s and 70s when there were civil rights leaders and members of the new left who J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI were, were, were targeting. And, uh, and outside of that, you know, they needed to create propaganda in order to justify going after them, in order to demonize them and help the public see them as people who were, um, you know, not community organizers, not assets of their, their neighborhoods, but people who were causing um, chaos and, um, and, and tearing apart the fabric of their communities by speaking out. And to, to a large extent, that's what they've done with Julian Assange. They've, 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 they've made him seem like um, a, 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 an agitator, but not in a positive sense, even though I like agitators, but to make it seem like someone who's anti-American, who um, you know, uh, they, in, the, in later years, they made him seem like he was aligned with Donald Trump, even though he never really um, did um, shack his horse to Donald Trump. And they, they've gone after him and, and, and made him seem like um, a, a figure who is unworthy of any kind of public support. And that, that was included in Niels Meltzer's report because it definitely has fueled the torture and it is, has added to the mental anguish um, and anxiety that has been a part of this psychological torture. All right, uh, thanks, Kevin. Thank you, Paul, for that question. We'll take uh, 
Okay, we'll take one more question from Jay and then we'll start wrapping up the program for the night. Uh, Jay. Would that be me? Uh, Jay, are you there? Um, okay, thank you. Um, I'm using a pseudonym cleverly. Um, it's really James. Um, I think it's really important to always do whatever we can to bring this kind of discussion back to the, the revelations themselves, which we've heard a little bit about tonight, which I think, which I appreciate. Always bring it back to what are we learning about the US government in particular in revelations. I wager that most people, including most people on this call, haven't read the, the Podesta emails. If you're like me, I sort of heard about the Pentagon Papers, but never actually bothered to read them. So I, we, we should all really do the best we can to actually read and learn about the revelations and disclosures and get whatever help we can from admirable folks like, like you, Kevin, to help us understand and give us some guidance to where to look for the highlights, the key points. So in that spirit, and I also say nothing like a sexual allegation to distract everybody's attention. I bet most of us know more about the sexual misconduct allegations about Julian than about any of the revelations in WikiLeaks. You know, so I would like you to speak, Kevin, to the story about Seth Rich. Um, Ray McGovern, 25 year CIA analyst, did the presidential daily brief, spoke, has spoken about this, others have. There is an allegation or an understanding that. Seth Rich, who was working at the DNC, used an, a thumb drive to download the Podesta emails, and that's how they eventually got to Julian Ash to WikiLeaks and Julian Assange. Um, Seth Rich ended up dead. There are, are there's speculation about what that might have been about, what might actually have happened. He was supposedly murdered in a botched robbery. Maybe it was in Rock Creek Park, but they, his wallet was still on his bot person. So. That's, that's a sort of an embellishment, but the, so can you speak to how did the Podesta emails, what's your best understanding of how they first got um, purloined? And if you have a sense of how did they get to WikiLeaks and what happened to Seth Rich? So uh, just so everyone's clear, the, I'll, I'll address your question, but I want people to understand that the information that Julian Assange is being criminalized for has absolutely nothing to do with this universe of information that WikiLeaks published in 2016. Um, and so- Well, thank you, thank you for that. So I, so I just want to make sure that people know that, uh, that, that, that he is you know, not being targeted for being involved in working on that material, which is why a lot of the work that I do, I don't spend a whole lot of time on that, but I can briefly address your question, which is to say that um, it's my understanding that Julian Assange said publicly that the source of the material was not, um, was not a source connected to any state government. And so uh, by doing that, he was eliminating the discussion or trying to deal with the discussion about the fact that, um, uh, about the fact that everyone thought it came from Russia. And so, you know, in, in doing this, he was also violating a, a clear guideline for the WikiLeaks organization which is that they will not publicly discuss, they will not publicly discuss source information. They will not reveal details about their sources. So we don't know a whole lot from WikiLeaks as far as who the sources were, and that's for the safety of anybody who is providing information. It's also for the credibility of WikiLeaks as an organization. Now, as far as what we know, based on the work uh, that you're referring to, there's a group called Veteran Intelligence Professionals for Sanity that did some analysis of how this information may have been transmitted. They looked at some of the allegations coming from US intelligence institutions or US government 
people who are backed by US intelligence institutions to say that it looks unlikely that it was hack, that it was a hack. It looks like it's, it's more likely that it was a leak and that in some way these emails were delivered. Um, there's also the, I believe um, there's a statement from someone connected to um, CrowdStrike who uh, says that the, the that in, in their opinion, when they look at it, there is an evidence that there was um, uh, a hack. Um, and so, uh, and I'm, I'm very, very loosely paraphrasing. Um, so, um, you know, that's as much as, as I'm willing to say, I haven't spent a whole time on what I think did or did not happen to Seth. And um, I'll Can you say what CrowdStrike is just yeah, it's a cybersecurity company um, that was brought in. But is but the one thing that I understand is that um, the FBI never got a chance to look at their servers and and see um, you know and see what they you know had had seen. You know they weren't able to like CrowdStrike made all these claims about what happened related to um, the the alleged, uh, and I, I highly emphasize the alleged election interference because I think it's been greatly exaggerated. Uh, and uh, so the FBI took all the claims of CrowdStrike at face value without assessing them themselves. They never got to look at their own um, their own equipment and, and, and review um, what they were describing to the FBI. Uh, they didn't, yeah, and and I'd agree with Phil. They didn't want to investigate the servers because it, it they would have found out the truth about what happened. There were a lot of people like John Brennan and James Clapper who were invested in what they were saying about what happened, and and uh, you know it's interesting to bring them up because those people are definitely opponents of Julian Assange and 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 supporters of what it is unfolding, and and people like Leon Panetta. Um, are supportive of this case against Julian Assange. And they're also people who are involved in perpetuating a lot of our um, understanding um, and, you know, and, and that being a false understanding of what took place um, during the 2016 election. Um, so, um, but uh, if I could just say one thing as we close out, would that be okay if I, if I, if I give just a closing thought, is that, is that all right? Yeah, please do. Um, uh, I think that all of that there's something really important that people like all of you can do, and um, and and it, it and you know like you're in a unique position not being professional journalists that you know it's possible if people want to they could go to congressional offices and they could have um, you know they, they could they could try to make this an issue with those people who are in Congress. I mean, one thing that has stood out to me is that in Europe, there are parliamentarians in Germany and uh, Spain and France and other parts of the European Union that have followed this case closely. And there are people in the United Kingdom and they object to what's happening and they're concerned about the future um, after Julian Assange's prosecution, but we didn't have anybody from the U.S. Congress show much interest at all in this extradition trial. There's no nobody was uh, nobody ever went overseas. Nobody I that I know of requested access to the extradition trial so they could follow it and um, and then express their concerns um, on their uh, official website later um, or or to to talk about it with uh, the media later and, and object to what the Justice Department was doing. So um, uh, the most important thing we can do right now is get people on the record and, and, and push them to oppose it, or if they support it, let's figure out why they support this. And then let's attack that. Let's go at that really hard and, and try to demolish any reason for anyone to support this case. Because I think it's really easy for us to make it crumble. It's, I don't think it's backed up by a whole lot. This is a pretty weak case, in my view, that they are bringing against, against Julian Assange. Um, and, and as I said earlier, it involves 
the time period in which there was the most support for WikiLeaks. Nobody doubts what WikiLeaks was doing in 2010. They might have doubts about what they did in 2016. They may doubt whether they're a functioning organization today because the US government has been hugely successful in limiting its ability to work while they are in the process of dedicating all of their resources to defending uh, Julian Assange. But what we can do is try to get people who are in influential positions on the record and figure out what they think about this case. And maybe we can force the Justice Department, you know, maybe we can even have people at the Justice Department or at U.S. Attorney's office, offices, you know, try to figure out what these prosecutors think about bringing this case against Julian Assange. What do they think about attacking people um, like this, um, going after uh, journalism in this manner. And um, I believe that that, you know, if, if you were looking for any kind of an action that you could do, you know, I would say, find some way to, I mean, obviously, we still live in pandemic times. So you may not be able to get a meeting with your congressperson. But, you know, you know, if, if you could find some way af after the vaccination rollout, after you, if you're able to get time with your congressperson to say something about this case, um, you know, in, in addition to whatever else is on your mind related to peace issues, you know, that could go a long way towards trying to force this, and then, and then report it. And then after you talk to your member of Congress, go post about it and, and let people know what they're saying, because we really need to air this out. And it's the only way that we're going to be able to save Julian Assange. Thanks, Kevin. Those are those are great points. And thank you, James, uh, for, for your question. All right. Uh, we're going to we're going to wrap this program up. I'm just going to promote two quick uh, action items here again uh, on February 22nd. There's going to be a rally in favor of Julian Assange. They'll be meeting at Park Street at 11 a.m. Uh, and, and marching uh, to the Boston Globe. Uh, so uh, Susan McLucas, you can, you can contact her if you want more information about that. It's also posted on Mass Peace Action's uh, website on the events page. Uh, I'll share info about that in the follow-up email uh, that I send tomorrow. I'll also send a recording of this video. So please do share the video uh, with, with your friends and family and your networks. Um, the last thing I'll ask is uh, Brian Garvey, our assistant director, he's going to be sharing a donation link for Mass Peace Action. Uh, if you find these programs to be informative or beneficial in any way, please consider chipping in a couple dollars. Uh, it really helps us uh, uh, helps us set up these programs. Uh, we have uh, some really good ones uh, just this week. Tomorrow we have one on um, the new Cold War with China and, and US foreign policy. And then on Thursday, we are bringing in Trita Parsi to talk about the Iran nuclear deal and uh, relations with Iran. And then we have a couple of big ones in March that we haven't announced yet, but they're scheduled. So keep an eye out. Uh, if you can, uh, please consider chipping in a couple dollars. And again, the rally in favor of Julian Assange is on February 22nd. Uh, thank you everyone for your time tonight. Thank you, Kevin, so much for your time tonight. Uh, where can people follow your work if they want to uh, fo follow up with your work? Yeah. First, let me thank everybody for the questions. I really appreciated being able to engage with you. And if you go to shadowproof, S-H-A-D-O-W-P-R-O-O-F.com, uh, that's where you can find um, the, the wider universe of work that I do. But for just the whistleblower stories and the coverage of Julian Assange's case, you can go to dissenter.substack.com, D-I-S-S-E-N-T-E-R.substacks.com and find um, that regular coverage there. So thanks again, everyone. I really appreciated being able to talk with you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And I'll share those links Kevin mentioned in my follow up email tomorrow. So keep an eye out for that. All right. Thank you again, Kevin, so much. And thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. So, everyone, have yeah. a great night. Thank you. Good night.